Aaron Leonard and Bob Cass and Chad. Did I say, oh, I forgot how to say your last name. Say it for me. It's long name, Case and Chad, but that's right. Case and Chad, not Cass and Chad. Case and Chad um, are, joining, uh, are joining us today at the OUX Happy Hour. Um, they are our resident knowledge graph experts within this community. So um, I don't know if you knew that, but you are. Uh, being as you were on the podcast a year ago, then we re-aired your podcast because it was so popular. Um, so uh, probably we'll need to do a follow-up soon. Um, so I was in a IA conference workshop with Aaron and Bob a little over a year ago, and was just fascinated. Could totally see the connection between object oriented UX and knowledge graphs, since knowledge graphs are all about connecting things and relationships between things and getting knowledge and wisdom. And that's why it's called a knowledge graph, right? Because you can have a bunch of data and you can have a bunch of information. But once you start connecting that information, that's when you start to kind of get to that point of knowledge and wisdom. Um, so it really is about connecting things, which object or UX, we like connecting things and connecting things in context, um, giving more meaning to those things through the connections. So. Um, I'm still wrapping my head around knowledge graphs. And so I felt like, you know, learn by doing. So we, uh, we started talking a few months ago about potentially using OUX in a really meta way. So actually uh, taking the ORCA process, which if you're new to OUX, I'm going to be kind of doing a crash course on it, like a 30 second crash course on it. So that's all good. If you're coming, coming into this completely fresh, all good there. Um, so, so we started talking about, can we actually, uh, build a knowledge graph for OUX and can Sophia prepare the data by using the ORCA process? Um, so it's a very much snake eating its tail situation here. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. We've got a few slides for you, and then we're going to switch over into demo mode. Um, I have no idea what Aaron and Bob are going to show, um, I have a little bit of an idea, but really, I don't really know. So we'll be we'll be going through it together. Um, and those slides are going to be. Um, let's pause this music. Those slides um, are going to be kind of a driver of a conversation. So Aaron and Bob, please chime in, um, and we can chat about some of the stuff that we're looking at. So all right, I'm going to go ahead and jump in. All righty. Okay, so preparing data for an OUX knowledge graph using the ORCA process. Ah! <laughs> We're just going to look at this for the next hour. Okay, yes, very <laughs> meta here. Um, so if you are not quite sure what a knowledge graph is, it's easy to show, show the kind of manifestation of a knowledge graph. And, um, and Brad Pitt is going to help us do that. So if you Google Brad Pitt, we're looking at right here along the side of basically Google's knowledge graph. So we've got our kind of raw um, search results here. And then we've got this, this little card thing. I call it the knowledge panel here. And this actually shows Brad Pitt, it says, says what, what is the entity type or what is the object type? Brad Pitt is type American actor. Um, we've got a bunch of data about him. And then we've got these connections, what in the, in the OAUX world we call nested objects, right? So we've got the movies and TV shows that Brad Pitt is in, strangely showing friends. Um, we've got profiles. We've got what other, other, other um, entities that people search for. And then we can see these connections. So if we actually click on Fight Club, it'll show a Google results of Fight Club. And we can see the Fight Club panel. And then we can also learn that fight, right down here at the very bottom, Fight Club is also a novel. And then I can actually click on that and I can see the card for, the, for Fight Club, the novel. So I can see these basically these kind of instances of entities like actor, movie, book, and then we can start to, to uh, kind of see the, the thorough um, the thorough line of those connections. And so what what we talked about a little bit yesterday was what's going on here is the search results, which are the, the standard Google search results that you expect are on the left-hand side. And then if it finds an entity, 
um, that it matches your search, it brings up the knowledge card, which is essentially driven by an ontology. So in our parlance, a knowledge graph is an applied ontology. It's an ontology, just structure of objects and their relationships connected to data and content. So not only is there a, a button that says Fight Club, it doesn't just say the word Fight Club, it's actually connected to that entity and the card about that entity, which is connected to all those entities. So the preferred data sources that they use, you can see they get data from Wikipedia, from IMDB, from blah, 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 as well as some user uh, you know, people also search for. But so those entities and all their information are connected to the entities, all their information, all the things are drawn, all the lines between all the things. You have this big ontology thing connected to the content that it's that it's surfacing. And that's the, that's the sort of background structure. Go ahead, Aaron. Yeah, two, two thoughts about this. So one, you mentioned the preferred sources. And you can see that that's what's happening in this knowledge graph is Wikipedia is always at the top. It's not Wikipedia or Britannica or Miriam, you know, it's always Wikipedia, it's always IMDB. So they have their preferred sources. So there's a little bit of curation going on there to say, mm -hmm. these are the ones we trust and like instead of random junk floating up to the top. The other mm -hmm. thought about this is they coined the term knowledge graph, but the way they construct this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw a little skepticism on whether they're actually using an ontology. And the reason I'm a little skeptical is because Google can do the thing that none of us can do, which is have billions and billions and billions of searches that they can engineer and design algorithms around. So I would like to think they're using an ontology behind it, but I don't know if they actually are or if it's all just graph based around just this gigantic quantity of information that they've churned in here and that they're not even, they don't even bother to disambiguate terms because they have so much mass mm. and power and server energy going into this that they don't need to. Well, and, and you find sometimes, and they've cleaned some of this up, but you, there used to be some error, so. Um, oh, and friends here, which which we, we talked about earlier this week. Friends Jennifer Aniston, up. that's yeah. the connection. Yeah. The connection so is Jennifer Aniston, right? He was uh, married to her and. Yeah. So John yeah, Williams yeah. is the composer yeah, of Star Wars yeah. music, and there's also a very well-known oh, classical episode. guitarist named, probably the most famous classical guitarist named John Williams. And it used to be that the Knowledge Graph card had conflated these things. So some of the pictures were of the composer, some were of the guitarist and the birthdays and this. Stuff. Now they've cleaned that up because people started noticing it, but mm -hmm. this is not 100% human. I mean, there's millions and millions of these cards. So this is all um, machine assembled and displayed so that when it's going and grab you exactly. So one, one of the these, uh, some of these things like they, they are errors and they those get human curated to do the clean mm -hmm. up so there's some there's a little curation that goes but and to, and going back to just you know saying like okay we're going to get this information from wikipedia but when we're talking about a book we do get information from wikipedia but the information from goodreads the score from goodreads and the score from barnes and noble like right they put put right next to each other so users can kind of balance that you kind of have the um the two different sources for a little bit more trust there but they prioritized the score over the wikipedia so individual entities have the data prioritized in different ways um, even the image actually is you can see here the title of the book is first then the author, while if it's a, if it is a actor, we've got, we've prioritized images. So somebody is probably making those decisions saying like, okay, we've got this type of thing. How are we going to move the, um, the pieces of what, what pieces of data do we need and how are we going to prioritize it? How are we going to actually display those bits of data? All right, so um, just a side note here, because we were talking about Fight Club, three rules of OAUX happy hour. Talk about OAUX happy hour, talk <laughs> about OAUX happy hour, and talk about OAUX happy hour. So please, live tweeting is encouraged. Um, hashtag OAUX, like I couldn't help it, I had to put that in there. Um, okay, so the problem here, <laughs> so unlike Googling Brad Pitt or Fight Club or Angelina Jolie, uh, when you Google, call to action matrix, or you Google object map, not only are the search results not exactly relevant to OAUX and the kind of artifacts that we create in this, uh, this geeky little world, we don't have one of those cute panels, right? And what we're gonna be doing today is not gonna solve that problem, right? This is a tiny baby step in that direction. And probably a Wikipedia article would be a good idea, right? But, um, but just to let you know, like that's not, we're, we're moving a tiny little baby step in that direction, but we're not gonna be able to end this call. I, hopefully you weren't expecting that. And to be able to change how Google is actually 
presenting um, searching uh, OUXE terms. Uh, maybe we'll get there in a few years. Okay, so let's talk about goals. What are the goals um, for, you know, just uh, the, the near-term goals and sort of some of the problems that I'm hoping maybe a knowledge graph could help solve. So one thing in OUX is we preach the importance of words and definitions. So we need to walk that walk, walk that talk talk that walk. Uh, so we need to get clear on our words and our definitions. And because OAUX is growing and more people are using the ORCA process and various versions and various color coding and using different words for different artifacts, we need some governance to help us communicate and collaborate better. So when I look at, uh, when I take a look at, at Lisa's object map or Cassie's object map, I can just take a look at it and have that x-ray vision and they're not using different colors or different words for things because that is something that we preach and that OUX helps you do within an organization is help you get clear on what the things are, right? And make sure everybody's using the same words for the same things and not different words for the same thing and the same word for different things. We want to avoid that. So we really want to kind of start walking that walk. And OUX is constantly evolving and new terms are, um, are bubbling up. They're continuing to emerge. Uh, we're debating terms. We're, con we're still, you know, we're still pioneers here. We're all pioneers. Um, so we need that public source of the current truth. So maybe this can help us get there. Yeah, a couple, couple of thoughts on, on your goals there yeah. too. Um, obviously, we love the first one because that's what ontologies and controlled vocabularies are all about, are um, coming up with those standard verb, you know, word forms that we want to use. Um, however, what we also see in a lot of our, our clients and, and what the demand usually is, is the idea that there's not just synonyms, but there's various ways of saying things, and we can never truly within an organization get to consensus. So you have to do some clever transforms. Now, when I started doing this, it was like, mm -hmm. this is the authority. You will bow down before the taxonomy. This is this is the way it is. But once you get in there and you get into a couple organizations, you realize, yeah, that's not really, you can't just do that. You can't be all top down and authoritative and like that. You mm -hmm. have to do some compromising and there has to be some changes in the way that things are presented to those end users. And you got to be a little flexible about how you how you present those things. Yeah. Um, and then that last thing, taxonomies are never done ever. Right. And, and I, when I was showing you the, uh, the glossary that I made, the messy glossary that many of you have seen, um, which is now being cleaned up a little bit. Uh, one thing that, that uh, both of you liked a lot is how I had alternate terms. For us. So I had the term and then here's what other people call it. And here's, and then a specific column for here's what developers might call this thing. So that the developer term versus other types of terms. So, um, and kind of what we, how we might use words interchangeably. Uh, yeah, just getting really clear on that. So um, as <laughs> so, uh, 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 obligatory double diamond slide. So often we put this ORCA process. So ORCA is the process that we use uh, to, to build great OAUX. So it stands for objects, relationships, CTAs, and attributes. And I like to put it smack dab in the middle of the double diamond. So first you got to gather all your research together to go into the ORCA process, which is definitely a garbage in garbage out process. If your research isn't very good, probably the value of the ORCA process still go and do ORCA, but what it's going to do is it's going to, it's going to show you make every, it's going to make it very clear to the entire team that you have to go back to research. It's kind of like a gauntlet um, that you have to get to get through to actually start working on design. So what kind of research did I do for this particular process? So in gathering the stuff, what kind of data could I give to Aaron and Bob uh, to, to work their magic on? So one thing, like I was just mentioning having this glossary. So I had a glossary and a spreadsheet. We had alternate terms, had about 76 terms in there. Um, and they were categorized by things like artifact and activity or basics or inheritance. So there was some categorization there as well. Uh, then we also have, of course, the process. Uh, many of you have seen this slide before. So we can see the pillars of the ORCA process, objects, relationships, CTAs and attributes, and then the multiple rounds. So ORCA is an iterative process. 
So we've got the Orca pillars, and those are actually, I'd already put those into Webflow. So OUX.com is built on Webflow, which has a really great uh, CMS. So I'd already put them in. It's not public on the site yet, but I am working on that to basically allow visitors to OUX.com really explore the Orca process and be able to navigate through these pillars and also navigate through the rounds and learn about what happens in each round and why each pillar is important. So those were already in the CMS, uh, just logged in there just as words, not a lot of information in there. And then also we have steps. So that's the intersection, right? So something like attribute prioritization or, or uh, object prioritization. So those were also uh, in, the, uh, in the CMS. It's kind of like those main 15 steps of the ORCA process. So we had that, and then we had some, a little bit more structure here, but the cool thing is, so something like object prioritization in the, C, in the CMS was nicely connected to the ORCA pillar. So that would be objects and the ORCA route prioritization. So we did start to, the connections were, were, uh, were built. All right, also had FAQs, uh, really messy, but I've been uh, working, so the past four cohorts, really trying to synthesize the FAQs, figure out what are those questions that keep bubbling up to the top. And um, right now it's a lot of like copy pasta going on um, and, um, and, and uh, just copying my answer from the forum into this. So a lot of, I'll just say word vomit, um, but it was in there and, these FAQs were also tagged by round and pillar. Uh, if there was a specific step, um, that would also be tagged as well. So requirements, attributes, and then some redundancy here specifically about this step and then uh, additionally other categories as well. So there was some connections with FAQs. Also had this system model here. Um, so I told you this was gonna be meta, right? So actually building a system model for the ORCA process. We've got pillars, we've got rounds, we've got steps. Those are all uh, intricately related. And then within steps, we have activities. So if the step is object discovery, we have an activity like noun foraging or instancing, all right? So some steps have one activity, some steps have four activities within them. And those activities are things that are usually you're doing collaboratively, um, it's the actual getting done. Then we've got artifact type, okay? And so activities um, are usually working toward an, uh, adding fidelity to an artifact type, whether that's the object map or the system model, the CTA matrix. Really in the, in the ORCA process, there's only like five or six artifact types. I think I have six now, including the prototype. And then we have templates and guides, right? And then we have this thing right here, the actual artifact or snapshot. So one thing I want to see in the future is I want, I want you all to be able to upload artifacts and snapshots on OUX.com and tag it as a certain artifact type to be able to be showcased and to actually start growing a database of a bunch of object maps and what was successful, like kind of case studies, right? Um, and then those artifacts be connected to an actual strategist too. So as you make really cool artifacts, can those artifacts start showing on your strategist uh, profile page? So this is kind of the dream, it's a lot though. Um, and then we also have resources, right? So this is all this information we have about the process and how we structure the process. All right, so let's actually use this process. We're not gonna use the whole process, but kind of go through these first couple steps because my hypothesis here and my hunch is going through the ORCA process can actually help you prepare your data to turn into a knowledge graph, to be, um, to be kind of synthesized into a knowledge graph. Okay, so we the OUXers, so we've, you've seen this slide before probably. So this is sort of the manifesto for what we do before designing a single screen. So we figure out what are the objects, we figure out what the relationships are, what the calls to action are, what the attributes are. And that aligns, of course, to the ORCA process. Now, then we started thinking, okay, and, and, I, and I really want Bob and Aaron's feedback on this. We, the OUXers, answered these questions before designing a knowledge graph. So thinking about not only what are the objects that carry all the important data, but we need instances. We actually need all the instances. We need to gather all those instances and clean up, make sure the data in those objects is actually really nice and clean. What are the objects' relationships to each other? And how do the individual instances relate, of course? 
calls to action. So I was thinking, hmm, this is the one that does not belong. What are the calls to action? Uh, do we really need that? But um, in the next slide, uh, we'll, uh, I, I think we'll, we'll talk more about this. And what are the attributes that make up the, uh, the objects and what are the values for all of those instances? Yeah, so I, it's no wonder you saw the connection because when you started describing this whole process, because I'm not really a UXer, I've, I've dabbled some because of the background, but, um, but I'm not, that's not really my, my core. But all of these things are exactly how we approach taxonomy and ontology mo modeling, because you get all this stuff and you have to decide what's what in the model as you do this modeling of, of these different things. And so are they in separate vocabularies? Are they the things themselves? Are they the concepts? Are they the relationships between the concepts? We get a lot of um, potential clients coming to us. And, and I've seen this as when I was on the not vendor side, um, where people want to build structures that maybe it's a step process where each child in a hierarchy is the next step or something of that nature. And is that really the way to do it? Um, and so you, you really need to decide what is what, you know, what should be a property, an, an attribute on a concept? What should be the concepts themselves? What should the relationships be between the concepts? And then what are the actual things, right? So you might have a taxonomy where you've got something called meeting minutes in it. It's not the meeting minutes themselves, but that's literally a descriptor that can go on some meeting minutes, which may be about topics, say, X, Y, and Z. Um, so this process is really similar to your point about calls to action. I think, you know, at least in my experience, a lot of that call to action stuff is the handoff. It's like, here's the taxonomy. It all works. Everything's great. Go do call to action stuff on the front end, wherever this is being surfaced. Mm -hmm. And maybe that goes back into some other database. Maybe it's an analytics, you know, a BI tool, maybe it's something else, because maybe that's not really taxonomy or ontology stuff. Well, and the difference is, so... In taxonomy land, you have a structure of terms and a hierarchy that you use to navigate a website or tag objects. And those that structure is a standalone and then you use it to reference an, an object. So the, the terms are sort of a structure and then you have all the objects and you tag a document or you direct to a web page. In ontology, those objects are objects in the same system as the terms are. So it's a very exciting way because you can more specifically you can more specifically talk about what the relationships between those objects are and what kind of objects there are. So in a taxonomy based content management system, you have a bunch of content, you have a column somewhere where you stick some tags in. Um, in an ontology, the object and the author of the object and the topic of the object are all things in the ontology. Mm -hmm. So it became very clear how this relates to the ORCA model in OOUX that you, because you're, and as, uh, as Sophia said, it's a little meta because we're using a process to model a process about process modeling so, <laughs> but, um, and recursive, but so, so what we're trying to do is draw the line between ontology and this OUX thing. And so the model that we're gonna share when um, Sophia's done with our slides is our sort of first crack at it. It doesn't have the content attached to it yet, but all those FAQ documents that you listed, once we add those to the model, now you can tag it with a step and a process and a whatever. And now you can like sort of do a multifaceted browse to connect these things and even just surf the graph to see the connections between things and find the line. Yeah, and that surf the graph. So the a podcast that I was listening to, to today to just kind of get my get my headspace right about knowledge graphs. Uh, they were talking about how the you know if you if the connections that you care about are usually just like A is connected to B, and then maybe B is connected to C, then a relational database is fine. But like the not where the knowledge graph and the power of the knowledge graph is helping you make connections that you wouldn't have otherwise made on your own. And the, the guy was saying, he's like, you really want a knowledge graph when you start connecting things that are multiple hops away. And so that's, um, that's where I see like, you know, in, in OUX, we're always, we're trying to kind of consolidate the number of objects because these are user facing objects and we don't want there to be too many. And we want to say, okay, we have like the least effective dose. Like what are, what are the things here and get really clear on that within a knowledge graph, you want a lot of things. 
you want everything to be a thing so they can connect and you can say, okay, this is an artifact and it connects. This artifact connects not only to a strategist, but to a company into an industry. And then we can start getting that kind of like. So, yeah. And, and it's great for, it's great for social. I mean, that's why LinkedIn and Facebook and all of these, all of these uh, rely on graphs. Um, and, and that's exactly what they're doing because they can do things, you know, this friend of a friend idea, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, here's a person, here's another person, they're connected and they both know somebody else. Therefore, all of them are connected. And then you have this network. That's exactly what's so great about graphs yeah. is that you're connecting this, this web. It, that works the exact, and like literally there's an ontology called both, which is friend of a friend that's used to model social networks. And the other thing is, to your point, Sophia, about relational databases, when you have two tables connected by a key value pair, you're like, oh, those things are related. In a graph, you can name that relationship and specify it. So the way I've heard it put that's very useful to me is in a relational database, like the data, the fields are the first class citizens and the relationships are kind of implied. In a graph, in ontology, the relationships are first class citizens. They are just as much objects as the objects are. So the relationships become objects in mm-hmm. the system that then can have their own properties and whatnot, which is super And it's, it's no wonder that in this age of social media and relationships, right, your relationship to each other, your relationship to, to a product, your relationship to a place, um, that these graphs model that so well because you can name the relationship between them. Uh, mm. So, I mean, knowledge graphs, I'm becoming more and more convinced that it's all about the relationships. Yep. Yeah. I mean, how cool would it be to... I mean, if you're searching the FAQs and you find an FAQ and somehow, you know, the system knows what industry you're in and based on even what, what industry you're in, it could recommend other FAQs say, okay, you're looking at this FAQ. Here's another FAQ or here's even a strategist that you might want to talk to because they're also in your industry and like making those connections that might be those multiple leaps away is, um, could be just so powerful. So uh, looking at, like, if we, if we zoom into Fight Club here, and I want to kind of go back to the, the CTAs. Um, so we can definitely, as OUXers, we can probably start saying, okay, this is, a, this is a movie. We figured out that this is a, that's the object. We've got some relationships. Okay, maybe it has one of many actors, has one of many social profiles in this case. Um, we've got uh, some CTAs too, right? Now we've got also the, you know, photos and description and some metadata, like your release and genre and duration. But the CTAs is when I was like, I was actually surprised and looking closer. So you can actually watch, you can mark something as watched. You can add it to watch list. Let me know in the chat if anybody actually uses the C- any kind of CTAs or through, uh, through these uh, Google knowledge panels. Um, adding things to my watches. I have no idea where my Google watch list is, uh, but you can do that. Um, you can like, or you can dislike a movie as, as well. Um, so that, that's pretty interesting. Um, but when we were talking about this earlier this week, um, the interesting thing is when we think about CTAs, we're thinking about it from a user experience perspective. So what does a user want to do to this object? From a knowledge graph perspective, you kind of also want to think about it from an analytics perspective. And that's uh, an insight from from earlier this week about what kind of calls to action do we want to inform analytics? Which, yeah, I just think, yeah, Aaron, do you have anything to say about that? Well, you know, it's, it's, again, it's sort of that handoff, you know, and a, a graph database is quite good for doing analytics against, but, you know, we, you know, when I say we, I mean, uh, from Synaptica and this point of view that we have coming from a very taxonomy and ontology forward, we designed this tool, we designed this UI to manage vocabularies. And then all of that, that's a, that's a hub and spoke model. It's powering all these other applications, which may or may not even know that there's something behind it, right? Um, so some of these analytics, you know, the clicks, the likes and all that, um, could be associated with the ontology, but it's really being recorded probably in the back end database for analysis to put into a tool that's really suited for those analytics. Like, you know, we've, we've had people talk about analytics in the taxonomy tool. And it's like, yeah, but, but why, you know, really like, why not put a, put a layer over the top of that? Why not have an analytics tool that's taking some part of the analytics from your, you know, it's taking your ontology, but it's taking those those clicks and that data from somewhere else, and it's surfacing it into into some kind of um, analytics 
tool I mean, and, and dashboard. In the e-commerce environment, let's say I'm selling whatever it is that I sell online. Um, you go, you buy a product, like, that's great. I can send you emails. I can send you emails that say, well, you bought skis. Maybe you want to buy some more skis, which, which is stupid <laughs> because what I probably need is like ski boots and ski poles and ski mask and the ski goggles and the ski whatever, a cute ski outfit. But mm-hmm. if, if I can say, oh, look, Bob, the shopper added, he viewed these items and he added these to his cart, but didn't buy them, but he bought these items. Now I have data I can attach to my products, which say people who added this to their cart ended up buying this, or look at all the aspirational things Bob looked at, but didn't add to his cart because um, he can't afford them or what, what, we don't know what the reason right. is. Now we have extra data around these objects that we can attach to them. So, and that's a, that's a relationship between the node, me, the shopper, and the node, the object, and, and the category of objects. You can say, oh, looked at, and you can attach data to it. You know, how many times did I yeah. look at that thing mm-hmm. before I finally added it to my cart? How many times did I added it to my cart before I, before I finally bought it? How many things get abandoned in shopping carts? And like, now you have actionable um, instance level data that based on the graph that you can query from the graph about relationships and objects and users which I think is kind of what they're driving to here. I've never marked something as watched in the Google Knowledge Panel. I use the link to Wikipedia all the time. I use the link to IMDb sometimes, but I don't usually try and connect out to my Amazon Prime account. I'm worried they're going to send a drone to my house and drop the movie off or something. E-commerce is a great example because you can see where it works and where it falls down because Amazon's a great example, right? You look at it and... Can they nail a recommendation based on a relationship? Absolutely. If you like this band, if you liked this book, if you bought this album, they are great at recommending new things because it's all ontology based. It's all, you know, they're they're saying, oh, you like science fiction novels or you like this, you like that. And so it's really good at saying that. And they're pretty good about marrying the data to say, you know, if 10,000 people clicked on this book, 9,000 of them clicked on this other book, mm-hmm. therefore we're going to recommend it to this guy, where they're not very good at their analytics is point of sale, right? Even in their own point of sale, because as Bob said, you know, how many times have you bought something at Amazon and then it comes back and said, you might like this. It's like, I might like the thing I bought. I'll right. bet you I do because I just bought it. It how doesn't make any sense, do right? I before I mean, yeah, exactly. Like, box. hey, do you want to buy another coffee maker? No. I mean, how many coffee makers do I need? You know, if it's if it's something replenishable, right? If it's a face cream, then yeah, maybe I want to. You know, I want some more. Face but there's also because... two things going on there, and I didn't. This was not some place I thought we were going to wander into today. But there's two things going on <laughs> there. there. We are. <laughs> what objects are also like this, and what objects did people buy when they bought something like this? Mm-hmm. And balancing that yep. slider on a recommendation engine is very tricky. And you can break the engine. So there used to be this yeah. website. I don't know if it's still around. Called the Worst Things for Sale, and they would just go find outrageous garbage on Amazon. And the guy would talk about how outrageous. I mean, and some of it was just disgusting and horrible. Anyway. It's not worth going into, but go see if it's still out there. Worst things for sale.com. But so he would send people to the Amazon link to read the product description. So on these horrible products, it's like, I want a toilet sheet shaped like lips that I can sit on. You're like, okay, that's creepy. (laughs) Everyone from his blog would go look at all the objects on Amazon. So those objects all got recommended as linked to each other because people- Oh my gosh. Also linked to other horrible products. So they had nothing to do with each other categorically, except that they were horrible, except that all of his blog traffic would get driven over there. So it broke Amazon's engine because it would start recommending these horrible products that everyone looked at, even though they had nothing to do with each other than being blogged about. Oh my gosh. It's like a meme stock. <laughs> oh, exactly. That's exactly what it was like. Same, same oh man. All right. Let's, we, we got it. We got to get to our demo. So let's, uh, <laughs> let, let's, let's orca this. Um, and I just used orca as a verb. I did do that. Um, all right. So we got to go over to mural and I just realized I shut Chrome down because, you know, Chrome takes a lot of energy. So it signed me out of mural. So hang on just a second. Let's blah, 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 blah. Sign in. Please don't make me sign in. Why are you making me sign in? I was just signed in mural. Mural is killing me. Killing me. All right. Okay. So, so basically I went through the process like a good Good little OUXer. So I kind of went through, I took some screenshots of all the information that I had to start doing some noun foraging. So vocab terms seemed to bubble, bubble up to the top. Um, I thought that FAQ was going to be one of my main 
things. I, I went ahead and did some prioritization, but definitely step, pillar, round. And then things like artifact and um, activity even bubbled up because artifact and activity were actually categories on vocab term. And Aaron and Bob helped me realize this, that actually it was my category and my vocab term was actually needed to be an object in its own right. So artifact and activity pulled those out um, and then got really specific about artifact type. Um, so that would be that artifact, you know, an artifact would have hopefully at one point we'll have thousands of instances of an artifact, but artifact type, we've only have like five or six instances. It's CTA matrix, object map, nav flow, prototype, something else in there, I think. Um, so we've got vocab term, um, something like component, object, isolated object, shapeshifter, an activity, noun foraging, role definition, a step, attribute requirements, and we're gonna be treating step and pillar and round, or I'm sorry, not step, pillar and round as metadata. So did some system modeling, already kind of showed a little bit of that, went through my nested object matrix, um, and really kind of my big struggle here from an OUX perspective was, um, so artifact type and activity, do they also have a vocab term? So do I have a vocab term for noun foraging? the activity and then do I also have an instance of noun foraging that is an activity and I think that is yes and what I want to do is I want to say an activity has one vocab term that defines it uh, so that would actually pull in that information so that's one that I'm still kind of working on from an OUX perspective on you know I don't because I don't want redundancy I don't want to have the activity noun foraging with a description about all what is noun foraging we only found one of those in the model yeah. Okay. Um, and then the, yeah. And then also have it as a, as a vocab term and, you know, have that like, oh, if I'm going to, you know, want to update my, my description of a noun, of noun foraging, do I change it in both places? So, you know, hate changing stuff in two, in two places. So that's kind of what, um, so that all turned into um, collections in the CMS, I actually started pulling that into the CMS, building those collections and then exported it into a bunch of CSVs, handed those over to Bob and Aaron yesterday morning. And uh, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll turn it over to y'all to kind of see, see what we've got. You want me to share, Aaron, or you want it? Yeah, sure. Yep, that's okay. fine. So uh, Sophia handed over a bunch of CSVs and we turned to our tool, which is called Graphite. It's a, it's a taxonomy and ontology tool built on a graph database. Um, and ingested it and try to start sorting out the model. I think there's a couple ways to do this, but again, we got the data yesterday morning and spent yesterday afternoon on it. So I think we're making a lot of progress. So essentially we decided that there are six kinds of objects, um, activities, artifacts, pillars, rounds, steps, and terms. I think terms has the most things. I think it's about 75. Mm -hmm. um, and some of these like the pillars and the rounds only have three or four things in them. And we can look at individual ones in a moment. But I wanted to start here with the high level diagram. So this is your upper ontology high level structure. So a, uh, a round can have a term and a round can have a step and a step can have a pillar. The terms are connected to everything because the terms are, the terms is like a glossary, right? That describes, which is maybe what you'd want to surface on the site for browsing. Um, and so the terms are connected to everything, but artifacts are connected to activities and steps are connected to rounds and pillars are connected to steps mm -hmm. and everything is connected to terms. So we use some and custom relationships that we just stood up really quickly. Um, step has round. I don't know how well you can read these, but term has round. Everything has a turn. Activity has artifact working on. Um, and, and so we modeled uh, we modeled these things. I'm going to show you a couple individual records and then we'll look at the graph. Go ahead, Aaron. So just a comment here on this project visualizer. So so people in the comments have brought up some of these, these differences too. And so if you think about it, and, and I don't you know, the terminology matters. So when we talk about, it, there's going to be a few differences here. We talk about these top level things as being schemes. But if you, from this visualization, what's really clear is this is the model. It doesn't have to have stuff in it, right? So this is the ontology. This is the backbone. And whatever you put in there as individual values, now this one is populated, but that's the key. When you talk about, you know, whether it's scheme modeling or object modeling, the idea is really the same is that here we've got these top level 
We've defined relationships and we've defined schemes that are discrete, right? Rounds and terms, they're discrete. They have differences. And so this is the upper level model. And what you put in there as individual concepts or instances is kind of up to you. And this is the real beauty of using knowledge graphs on graph databases is it's shareable. You can kick this out you know, in a standard format, somebody and somebody can connect their model to your model. And again, it's all about relationships. You can get a couple models together and see if it works out, you know, do some blind dates right. or whatever. Some it's... of the basic <laughs> principles there of ontology are at work, which is they're, they're extensible, they're flexible, and they're interoperable. So we can kick this out in RDF and any uh, and load it right into Protege or load it right into any other uh, RDF based system like this, this, the, 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 the the technology using just to describe this behind it isn't proprietary. It's shared. It's standards based. It's W3C standards based. And mm -hmm. to Aaron's point, each of these things, I mean, Sophia sent them to us in different spreadsheets. So we modeled it that way, but really each of these has different sets of attributes. So if we look at one of the activities, here's our list of activities. If we look at attribute foraging, so all activities have the following fields. They can have so we made this, Sophia, and we didn't get here mm -hmm. with you, but we could we could um, put these in a hierarchy. Oh. So we allowed them to have broader and narrower terms, so we didn't do it. Yeah. But it can have a relationship with it. So everything in the middle column here is relationships to other terms. So attribute foraging is connected to the term attribute and the step attribute discovery uh -huh. and has another term around foraging. And then over on the right-hand side, I need to move my Zoom window. Over on the right-hand side are all the attributes, which are fields you fill in, not relations to other terms. So it has a label, it can have alternative labels, it can have, we put left a place in here for a description, um, a category, a definition, if there was a dev term, an example, mm -hmm. you gave us a unique item ID. So this, this would be able to connect it back to your CMS, because we retained that. Oh. Mm -hmm. Right, so yep. it would be interoperable <laughs> with that system. And then it can have a note, and there's a bunch of part of speech, and there's some other stuff, including, and this is crucial, a URI. So this object has a URI. And in fact, in an ontology or a knowledge graph, everything has a URI. Everything is named by a URI. And that way, any computer that does this stuff can resolve it with each other by visiting that URI and pulling information from it. So every relationship has a URI, every object has a URI, every attribute type has a URI. Use URIs to name everything. That's the that's and, like and where thing. we sort of draw the line, um, you know, Bob and I, it's funny because we went to this we both attended this online Stanford uh, knowledge graph course. And the, the definitions of knowledge graphs were different depending on who was doing what. And we really come from an ontology, of course we would, we're taxonomists, we're ontologists, this is our background. We come from a very ontology forward to a view for a knowledge graph. If you design the, the ontology, you model your world, right? You model your domain, and you model, like we've done here, right? This is the world we care about, this is our domain. You model that, you get all the relationships, and then you start to connect to things. And those URIs are those things, right? There's a real world mm -hmm. web page item out there in the world that we're going to connect to this ontology. And then it's all, once you've connected it to that outside data or object, that's where we sort of say across the line from ontology to a knowledge graph. Like so, now we're connecting to things. Right. And so what's, what's missing here, the next thing we would do is add a scheme, an object class called content, which wouldn't be the content. It would just be the URI that points to your FAQ. And then we could tag that thing with various tags from the ontology. So remember the graph we were just looking at, that was the upper level structure. Yeah. This is a particular node structure. So attribute foraging is part of step attribute discovery, has related term noun foraging and has term attribute. And we can start browsing the graph between these <laughs> to expand it to see all the other relationships between the things that are in here. And I didn't curate this. so. I <laughs> But we can start um, traversing the graph to see all the relationships between all the things. So we started here at attribute foraging, and now we're over here, and then objects has the, and so you can just keep cooking them open. So, uh, and then again, you would have an, a node over here that's called FAQ one or FAQ getting started or whatever it is. And it would be tagged with some terms from any or all, whatever you allowed it to be tagged from. If it could get tagged with a, t a step in a round in a pillar and an artifact or whatever. And I didn't click. And this these. is a great way to illustrate, Bob, could you go back to that visualization on yeah, an yeah, individual yeah. term and blow it up? Because this is a great way to visualize and demonstrate the difference between the ontology modeling of the world and the and the specific concepts. So go to the gear and show the different schemes in here too. 
Okay, show and yeah, show scheme nodes. Boom. Oh, yeah. Right. So now we've got the things, right, that we've populated, and we've got the schemes. So we're starting to see both the, the intersection of the model and the stuff that's in the model. Right. So, so these it, dark it, nodes are the abstract model that we showed first. Ah. And then like pastel mm -hmm. colored nodes are the actual object. So you can click on and off to see the abstract model and how it's relating. So these things are all steps. These things are all activities. Things. You know, so if I, uh, well, actually, I don't think I can expand it from terms, but. Um, yeah, it won't it, because it's, yeah, there's too many things to. <laughs> it, it doesn't allow you to do that because it'll blow up the UI, so. So there's a yep. few more details and we can uh, we could show you exactly what's in here, but I'm more interested. I know, and I know we can go over the hour a little bit because it's happy hour, even though out here in mountain time, it's only four o'clock. Um, <laughs> I'm working, but um, <laughs> but there's a bunch of stuff in the chat I haven't even looked at. I'd like I'd like to make sure we can show some other stuff in details, but I want to make sure we have a chance to interact with everyone else, answer questions or observations or whatever that you want to do. Sophia, you're the yeah. You're the, yeah, and, and some of the some of the questions have already been answered, but I would love to hear y'all's explanation on the difference between a URL and a URI. Right. So a URI is not not necessarily human readable. It's a it's a resource. Um, so a, U, a URI might resolve for a computer, but it might not be a web page that you can look at. And um, a URL, I'm pretty sure, and maybe I have this wrong, but I think a URL um, is a resource, not just an identifier, but a locator so that you can navigate to it and browse it. I might have that wrong. I bet Larry knows. Uh, yeah, that's exa exactly right, Bob. Yeah. yeah. So a URI is a okay. web page that you might not be able to read because it's for a computer to read. Basically, if you take one of these things and all of its relationships and all of its attributes and all the data in it, a URI is a thing, an object on the web that's uh, that you can get through from your browser. But if a computer does it, it can pull data from it. But if you go look at it, it might not be a web page that a human can read. Okay. So, so all URLs are URIs, but not all URIs yeah. are URIs. That's a what I'm URI saying. is the thing, and a URL tells you the thing plus how to read it how to how to see then render the thing yeah okay awesome so uh so yeah so are there any other questions put them in the chat or feel free to just go off mute if you have any other questions about, about what's happening here and i haven't reviewed the stuff in the chat because yeah. i was I've been trying to yeah there's so. i've been trying to answer some of this but there's a lot of there's a lot of conversation going on so Probably would be better just to have people One of the yeah. things ask any questions or make their statements or all questions are coming in and we're talking. I considered that maybe your terms could be arranged into a hierarchy so that it's not just a flat list. So I have yeah. um, uh, Orca pillar, Orca process, Orca sprint, Orca step. What if these were all you know children of Orcas and I can just drag right. these mm -hmm. over here and make them children so that A, yeah. this flat list, because flat lists are, as you guys are part of, you know, as UXers, mm -hmm. six, eight, 10 things is okay, 12 things is, 20 things is, 70 things is. So we could say, okay, well, if you want to look under Orcas, and I'm not sure what. Orca and then like Orca process, can you go multiple levels deep? I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. So you then like all of that, you yeah. would have actually Orca process and like step sprint rounded pillar would all go under orca process oh yeah. i see step sprint yeah. round pillar. yeah we we never got this this deep with you as far as what could have been hierarchical yeah um so we thing, just had and these that's something that like a cms doesn't like a cms isn't going to do very well like i don't know how i would do that right. within webflow Right. So that. I didn't do that, but I thought about it, but I didn't, but I don't know this mm -hmm. subject matter well enough to, to do it well, but you can see here now we have a little, and if you could collapse this down to say eight to 12 top terms, it would be a navigable structure that you could actually offer on a browser mm -hmm. interface to get to the topic that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. so, uh, the other yeah. thing we didn't do, which I thought about doing was you have one that's, um, I think it's the steps. It's like the order of the steps. And yeah. One through fifteen. We didn't try and model. You can do it, but we didn't model them. Oh. So they go linearly. Yeah, and we we oh. talked about that because I've got another model where I create a relationship called has precursor, because in this system, and this is something we're actually going to change or or add a feature for. Um, it the the default is alphabetical sort, right? So if you have steps, your choice is to put a number in front of it, a letter in front of it, right? Um, but what I did in one of ours is it was a list of films 
And because they, they came in an order, right? But they were alphabetized. So I created a relationship called has precursor. So when you look at one film, it says, what was the film before it? And I could, I could easily add a relationship for what comes next, right? So you can mm-hmm. add those as relationships and do it. That, that's one way to model things is to, is to just say, it's got a relationship and here's step one. And the next step is, is related um, in some way. Yeah, I mean, that would definitely make sense for that one. So I, my question is, um, so all of these objects that we have in here, these schemes have pretty finite amounts of instances. Mm-hmm. Um, activities is going to be, I think it's like 44. It's probably going to maybe grow a little bit. We'll do others. We'll come up with other activities, but it's not going to, shouldn't grow a lot. Um, all of the terms might grow, but hopefully it won't get over like a hundred or something. Right. Well, like um, are really small, right. Pillars, rounds and steps. Yeah. Are- yeah. It's really small. The value is going to come when we start getting a, a scheme in here that has a ton of instances. Right. Like what, that's when you where say you really just start to, seeing it become about well it, it depends because um we have i mean you know I, I always refer to clients but they're the they're the best examples of what's happening in the world and we've got clients who have a multiple you know they've got 10 or 15 schemes and none of them are very big and they all work in conjunction together and it, and it drives a lot of stuff mm. then we've got like publishers and their schemes are like a million items because they go super deep and they're super granular and they're super huge and it depends on what you need them for. Like you don't want to browse that. That's terrible. It's a terrible experience for most people unless there's you can a, filter it. Um, a- so it kind of depends on what you're trying to do with it. If you're, if you're trying to auto categorize uh, gigabytes or terabytes with a content, then maybe you need this massive granular vocabulary behind it that people don't navigate. But if you're navigating things and you're trying to make it light and flexible, you probably want more and shallower schemes. Well, and so one of the one of the things we sort of learned last year when we were auditing that Stanford Knowledge Graph course, which Aaron put a link to in the uh, chat, all those videos are free available online. It's pretty cool. But that was a computer science course. We're information scientists and computer science and information science overlap in the Venn diagram, but they are not the same. And their perspective about Knowledge Graph was very different than ours. Ours is about connecting it to content for data, for retrieval and analytics, they're much more about machine learning and inferencing and doing scale as a structure that then you can, um, then you can use to inference like um, either, you know, uh, let's, you've tagged a bunch of medical records and you want to try and learn, make, teach a computer to read lung x-rays or whatever Mm -hmm. it is. And Mm -hmm. so those perspectives are a little different. The computer science perspective is more about having all the objects that you can. There was one company that gave a talk there. They crawled the web every three days to make 4 trillion triples out of unstructured text into a graph that they use. That's very yeah. different than, I want to organize some information on my OUX website for retrieval. You don't need it. <laughs> so the answer is really the scale depends on the context of, of the project and, the, and, and we can't forget, and as information scientists, where we sometimes butt heads with the UXers and IAs is that we're building these abstract structures and it's up to someone like y'all to bring the user picture into it and make sure that the thing we're doing actually makes sense from a user right. perspective. Because abstract models modeling topics mm-hmm. in a way that are technically true, but no one understands. My favorite example is right, like in taxonomy, um, there are rules for hierarchy, right? And um, things are broader terms of other things. If I'm building a website for a pet store, I don't care that dog food's not a dog. I'm putting dog foods under dog because that's where my user's gonna find it. Whereas Mm -hmm. a taxonomist is gonna say, dog food is a pet food. Pet foods aren't pets. You don't eat your dog. Like we don't want to draw false inferences from this. And not only that, but just again, that quantity of things. I mean, the most common thing that we hear is the taxonomist wants to see all this. None of our users want to see all this. <laughs> they want to see some filtered subset. I, you know, if I've got 50,000 terms in here, I want to drop down that's got 10 in it, right? And maybe there's five drop downs, mm-hmm. right? And, and that's the most common thing we ever hear is that I want massive schemes and massive data in here, but I don't want my users to see all that because it's a nightmare, right? They, they, they don't want to deal with that. To an example, like in an e-commerce environment, maybe I have 8 billion products I don't want all those products in this. This is to manage the data about the products. It's connected to the product data in another system. 
So those pr every instance of a product doesn't necessarily live in here. I don't want to manage it this way. This is about categories and schemes and abstractions and relationships and mm -hmm. attributes that get attached to the products. You have some system that's built to manage product information, which is enhanced by connecting into an ontology tool. So the relationships between those products are more explicit, but you're not trying to manage every different pair of Levi's in, 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 the, in this interface. So Lisa and and, uh, and Upma have a question. Um, so we want the yeah, I was kindergarten just answering that kindergarten <laughs> breakdown. Okay. So and and I'm interested in this too. So and kind, of, kind of what I want from uh, from y'all is is homework for Sophia. So if the goal and, and coming down to after you build the, the question being after you build the knowledge graph, what are some applications for what you do with that graph? Yeah. Um, and then specifically, like I'm seeing this as. If the goal is building the knowledge graph to help somebody explore OUX and like to be a teacher almost for, for mm -hmm. what is it or to help, mm -hmm. like I'm in the middle of the process and I need help with this. What are some resources? What are some examples? What are some frequently asked questions? And like be able to, to navigate that and hopefully get yeah. the right content served up to somebody. And like we were talking right. about before, like maybe even based on their industry. Right. So yeah. somebody from the from yeah. fintech might get a different answer than somebody mm. that is working at a startup. Yeah. Like so I'd say a very common use case for a knowledge graph um, is it, it's internal for an organization, but it, it winds up being the same idea as if it were external is um, the, the age old problem in an organization is finding the stuff and the people that you need, right? Like uh, who knows about this, you know, expertise location. What is the, the work from home policy for my company? That's the most common basic wow. because everybody's like, I want Google in the enterprise. Well, you know what? You're not going to get Google in the enterprise. Sorry. Uh, it's, it's just like, even if you buy the GSA, which doesn't exist anymore, you're not going to get Google for the enterprise. Okay. So what you can do is you take your intranet, which maybe it's built on SharePoint because so many of them are, and you have a landing page. And that landing page is mostly just a search box and you search for your topic. And then this is where the knowledge graph comes in. I get content that's related to your search. I get people that are related to the search. And, and SharePoint, you know, Microsoft's already trying to do this, right? Um, and then I get um, events related to my search. And I get all of these things that are tied together and all that's very knowledge graphy. So I can say, what's my work from home policy? The work from home policy comes up and a link to it. And then the, the head of HR or whoever's responsible for work from home contact, their contact card comes up. Mm. And then, you know, the latest news update from the Twitter feed from the company comes up, all that stuff gets put together in a knowledge graph. And so that's a great use case because you're tying together all these different resources about that subject you're looking for. So in FinTech, one of the first big applications that we saw here um, was fraud detection. They use a graph for fraud detection. So if I have somebody with the same social security number that signs up for 26 credit cards over the same two week period, I flag that as something that's suspicious that I might wanna go. So basically you build a graph of all your customer information and activity, and then you, uh, you, you model bad behavior, and then you query your graph to find the bad behavior model that you found, and then you can go flood. Uh, hunt those down. So it's good for analytics in a way that con that 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 traditional, by which I mean traditional is like table-based tab tabular CMS, is not. So if I'm a publisher and I have um, I, I publish academic journals and I have 26 journals and I have 900,000 articles on physics. Um, one thing that I want to do is be able to offer better search to my users. So this is a taxonomy problem, right? If I go and I, and I search a database of a million articles for mercury, I'm going to get articles on planets and articles on cars and articles on chemistry. All I wanted was the planets. I'm an astronomer. But the flip side of that is if I have a 900,000 thing CMS with a bunch of tables, it's probably XML articles, and a bunch of metadata, I quit. that's not a database I can query. 900,000, XML is a great format for transmission and display of information, but it's not a database. I can't query 900,000 XML articles without running like a free text search on my file manager. I'm a publisher, I wanna be able to answer questions like, how many articles did we publish by authors from Harvard on any topic in mathematics in these three journals last year? And a graph lets you easily write that query. So you have a window into your content as data um, that, that, that you can use. Now, as to interfaces, some people, the graph is completely hidden. 
It's just behind the scenes driving stuff. Sometimes it's like in the Google application where you have search results with a knowledge card or something like that. And there are tons of applications. I should have invited Natasha. Um, I was talking to somebody who has a built her, they, their team built um, a homegrown graph visualizer and it's about uh, traffic traffic fatalities in England or something. And so it's like transport for England or whatever they call it. And they have all these maps and things and you can like drill down and like you literally surf the little graph like this, which is actually a map of like the, um, I need to find one that's better, um, to find one of the, uh, the road that you're looking for and then it can bring up the statistics. So there are definitely graph based browses and visual displays of a lot of information that allow you a different entry point into the graph than, um, like a top, like a taxonomy style, like, you know, kick out browse, as Dave Clark, our boss likes to say, the taxonomy, you know, you get in at the top level and you start unfurling it to go down. Um, and a graph's more like a subway map. You can get on at any station and browse the entire thing from there. It's not privileged by the hierarchy. All the nodes are, are potential entry. Yeah. And, and here's another, If so you were talking about industry related. So this is a loose thought, and this might be a stretch goal, but um, the whole point of ontologies is that there's in the, the original semantic web, right? The dream of the semantic web where everybody gets content for free and it's all connected and this is this beautiful, well, we haven't quite gotten there yet, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't keep trying. If you found industry specific vocabularies that mapped to this, and I don't know if this is the direction you were going, you, you map them here, right? You find publicly available vocabularies it's, and you start mapping concepts. It's more like industry specific objects. Oh. So like if somebody asks a question, is, is credit uh -huh. card an object? Yep. Well, it depends on, you know, what problem mm -hmm. you're solving, what, indi what oh, industry yeah, you're in. Okay. Is credit card okay. a local object? Well, Interesting. If you're e yeah, yeah, credit yeah. card is a yeah. local object. If you're in right. FinTech helping people with their credit score, credit card is definitely an object, you know, like, can the yeah, system yeah. get into so like are, actually are, modeling the world to help people understand how I should model a specific? That's what ontologies are supposed to do is to model a, a domain of knowledge or cross domains of knowledge. But if we go back to the, uh, the upper level ontology, which is the structure of mm -hmm. our OUX project without the stuff in it, um, these upper ontologies, we call them, are not always fantastic or done, but they're available in a lot of industries. There's one for e-commerce yeah. called... Um, E-class, and there's one for social networks called FOF, and there's one for fintech called mm -hmm. um, FIBO. Somebody FIBO, mentioned in the chat. Yeah. <laughs> so these upper ontologies don't yeah. have any. Larry, stuff Larry mentioned in the chat. Yeah. They don't have any stuff in them, like uh -huh. the upper level structures yeah. like this that people have developed that are being adopted across industries. That makes it even easier for stuff to be interoperable. Because if you're using FIBO for your fintech stuff, <coughs> and I am, and so is Aaron, but then it becomes easier to connect our instance level data today. Uh, uh, together because we're all using the same upper level structures to describe them. So, um, so let's, let's do two, two questions. So I, I do want to know what my homework assignment is. So if the goal is to create something that helps people learn about OUX and maybe answer their questions about the ORCA process, what's my homework assignment? Mm -hmm. And Lisa wants to know what her homework assignment is too. What is the best way to play around and get started creating a knowledge graph? So the first answer to you is we'd like to, for the terms, which we know you were throwing this together in short order, if we had definitions for every term and mm -hmm. then you gave us your FAQs with the URL, URLs that point to those FAQs, we can throw those in the graph. And now you should be able to browse from com content, uh, term to content and content to term or step to content or whatever yeah. it is. Now, Getting that surfaced on your website is going to take a little systems integration and engineering, probably beyond what we mere mortals can do. But it's pop, but it's possible. As mm -hmm. far as background reading homework, there's a bunch of stuff. Um, maybe we could come up with a list and then send it to you, and you can send it to your send it yeah. to. Your, but you know what? It, like these things too. I mean, how many use cases? I mean, how many people come to us as a vendor with selling a product? And they come to us with Excel spreadsheets, like all, all of them, them right? Everything. All of them. They don't, it's very rare. They're changing from some other products. Sometimes it happens. Usually it's like, well, we got all these Excel spreadsheets. We don't Organization, know organizations of shocking size and prestige right. that you would imagine have their shit by shit. I mean, data 
in Florida, <laughs> come to us with spreadsheets and we're like, oh my God, you're managing a bank? Holy shit, let me move my money right now because you yeah. guys have no right. idea what yeah. you're doing. Like, but, the, but the point is with that is that these Excel <laughs> spreadsheets and doing all that modeling in Excel, sometimes they're a hot mess and other times it's like, you've got it. Like that's everything. You've got the content, you've got the data, you've got everything mapped out. Everything is just perfect. All you need is a tool to to make it function. And, you know, there's, there's publicly available tools. Um, and those are, they're great, but they're, they're, they take like protege. Protege is great. I would never really knock protege. It's just hard to use. I mean, I'm in this space and I get in a protege and I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. It's difficult. It takes a lot of learning. So you can start modeling this kind of stuff in a protege, in a multitask, in one of those, but they're pretty heady. They're difficult to get around. There's not when it comes to this kind of level of ontology modeling, unfortunately, there's not a lot of cheapy, free stuff that's easy to use, too. It's like kind of one or the yeah. other. But <laughs> As people have been discussing in the chat, that, and uh, and Larry was saying he's done it, there's plenty of things that let you approximate this kind of modeling, but right. then there'll still be a, a step to transform it into an actual graph instead of just it looks like a graph. So Right, saying, and that's a great point, Bob, because some people, like, I mean, we've got two products, and our other one is relational. And it's all like fake it till you make it ontology. Like it's close and we call it ontology. It's not really ontology. And we let people know that. Whereas this one's on a graph database. So it really is. Maybe that doesn't matter. You know, you can, and actually one of the Stanford presentations was that like, you don't need a graph database. You can do this all relationally. And it's like, well, I guess you can mostly, right? It's not standards based and you don't get everything, but you can, you can do a lot with it. Yeah. So tell us, uh, so to wrap up, I think um, we've gone quite a bit yeah. over time and our, our group is starting to, are starting to dwindle. Everybody's moving on to the other parts of their day. Um, so Synaptica, tell us quickly, like who is, who is your audience? Who is your customers? And um, like, how do we know like, whether we should be using Synaptica and Graphite? That's, so I'll just make a very generic consulty kind of uh answer and that is we're very industry agnostic like mm -hmm. we do have a lot of publishers because that's sort of that's the past and that's coming with us but we're very industry agnostic we got people in travel we got people in social media we got we got all across the board so our audience there's a lot of marketers mm -hmm. a lot of marketing people doing this kind of stuff but our audience is is very broad and they're not always taxonomous some they're, they're total newbies it's so I'd say it's it's pretty broad and it's across. I millions. would say that the audience is anyone whose management layer has been convinced of the value of investing in semantic technologies, and our non-audience is yeah. people whose management have not been convinced in the value of semantic technology. <laughs> they can Great point. Along what they're Great doing. point. Uh, and really, that's the differentiator. Honestly, when someone contacts us, my job is not to sell them the software. It's to help them convince their boss's boss with the checkbook that they need to, to invest in this. Like it's the, right. the people on the ground, lots of librarians and people in that the sort of the metadata mm. e world and increasingly yep. the IA e world. Um, it really just depends on if you have yeah. any buy-in from above to to invest in the the tools and the technology right. and, the time and, and it's the to, to that point, it's about who's driving it in the organization. I mean, we're we're running through a trial right now with a company, and there's like fashion experts, and then there's tech experts, and then there's like ontology taxonomy experts, and they're all on the same call, and they're all contributing their value and their subject matter expertise to the common goal. So it's really interesting because you got people who are like, I don't even know what a taxonomy is, but I know fashion, and I know you know what what terms we use. Cool yeah. That's right. And cottage core. I didn't even know that was a thing. Apparently that's a thing. Wow. <laughs> All right. Well, please send us, send me those links of resources, um, yeah. links to people where people can find out more about y'all and Synaptica. And I will send those out. And reach out awesome. to us if you want to talk more. I know we didn't throw up a slide and we didn't want this to be a sales pitch. We want this to be fun. But Sophia knows how to get in yeah. touch with us. You can find us on Twitter, like reach out if you just want to talk ontologies or whatever. We're happy to we're, uh, we're geek sort of out. Your seat. we're evangelists too. We're we're trying to spread the graph gospel, you know. Um, and we love talking about it. That I will I will attest to that. Aaron and Bob have been great, <laughs> very uh, uh, available and generous with their time. So I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, this has been Thank recorded. You. This we'll is lots of fun. Out. All right, we'll send out the recording Thank you, on everyone. Monday. It was really fun. I hope we get to talk more. Oh, we will. Okay. <laughs>
Bye, Sophia. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye, everyone.